Good morning. And thank you for joining us for the sixth annual Family Business Symposium. I've met many of you before, but if you haven't met me, my name is Mark Taylor, and I'm privileged to be the Dean of the uh, Wyoming Business School here at Washington University. So the, uh, the annual uh, Family Business Symposium has become one of our very, very successful and signature events here at Olin. And I'm very excited about today's topic, the importance of culture in family business. As also, and also excited about our featured speaker, uh, Subramaniam Ramadorai. So Mr. Ramadorai, thank you for sharing your time, your wisdom with the Wash U Olin business community today. Thank you so much. I want to acknowledge the... I want to acknowledge the, the, the foresight, the vision, and the uh, significant generosity of the Koch family. Paul, Elke, Roger, and Fran, great friends to Olin, and I'm delighted to say great friends to me. And I'm particularly grateful uh, for the Koch's inspirational support to move the Koch Center for Family Business forward. The Koch Center educates the next generation of family business leaders, advances faculty research and connects family businesses to the resources they need to succeed. Paul, Alki, Roger and Fran, you make all this possible and for that we're extremely grateful and I am personally grateful for your, your friendship and support over the past four years of my time as Dean here, so thank you. I'm very excited uh, today also to announce a very important addition a very important move forward for the Koch Center for Family Business. And that is that uh, Peter Baumgarten, who's of course with us today, has been appointed as the Koch Family Professor of Practice in Family Business Enterprise, and also the new director of the Koch Center for Family Business. And in this new role, Peter will help grow the center's impact regionally, nationally, and globally. And you'll get to meet and hear from Peter later as he moderates the panel following the discussion with Mr. Ramadori. Peter joins an already impressive Koch Center team comprised of research director, research director Bart Hamilton, executive in residence Spencer Burke, associate director Alex Heyman, and administrative coordinator Amanda DeBoard. So congratulations, Peter. Great to have you on board. And of course, Peter is already a, a distinguished member of our faculty, but uh, he's taking on this new role, which we're all very, very excited about. Okay, so let's move on to today's program. And I'd like to introduce, first of all, Bart Hamilton, who I've just spoken of. Bart is the Robert Brooking Smith Distinguished Professor of Entrepreneurship and also the Research Director of the Koch Center of F Family Business. So without further ado, Bart, over to you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dean Taylor, and congratulations to Peter, and also a very, very special thank you from all of us at the Koch Center to the Koch family for supporting us and what we're doing and for supporting the symposium. So this is our sixth annual symposium on family business. Uh, I wish we could all be together in person, but uh, one of the virtues of doing this virtually is that we're going to bring in an exciting group of speakers over the next month. Uh, and all addressing this topic of the importance of culture in family business. And I think this is something that I know most of you out there managing organizations have thought a lot about and are thinking a lot about how can we improve the culture and how can we make our culture uh, more productive in our businesses, whether it's how do we make decisions? Are they hierarchical or do we decentralize? How do we communicate uh, one another? How do we solve problems? And uh, probably most importantly for family business owners, how do, we, how do we manage the relationship between the culture of our family and the culture of our business when it comes again to making decisions or to succession, a variety of those kinds of issues. So uh, we're gonna explore those issues over the next four weeks. So our format is a little different uh, than what we've had in the past. We're gonna have uh, a session each week uh, in the month of February. So February is Family Business Month uh, for the Koch Center. We're gonna explore these issues in a variety of different industries um, for both national US firms as well as international firms as we'll hear from uh, today. I think there's no right way to do this, but we're gonna hear about best practices from 
uh, some really all-star and amazing uh, firms and family business, uh, family business owners over the next four weeks. Um, our format, uh, as Dean Taylor said, is we'll have the first hour will be a directed conversation with our, our guest speaker. Um, and the second hour will be a panel discussion that will uh, reflect on the insights uh, from that first hour that uh, from the conversation with our speaker. So um, just so those of you who we'd love to have you participate um, and the way you can do that is using the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can write your questions there and they will uh, get to our speakers. Uh, and so again, you can do that at any time during the presentations, we'll probably do Q&A more towards the end of both the conversation with our guest speaker as well as the uh, panel discussion. And so without further ado, um, today we're very, very happy to have Mr. Ramadori from Tata Consulting uh, speaking to us. He will be uh, engaged in a conversation with, led by Spencer Burke, who's the Eugene F. Williams uh, Executive in Residence here at the Koch Center. That's in the first hour, and in the second hour, we'll have a panel discussion led by Peter Baumgarten, the newly appointed Koch Family Professor of Practice and Family Enterprise. And without further ado, let me uh, introduce uh, Spencer Burke. Spencer? Thank you, Bart. Uh, what a pleasure it is for me to welcome everybody here today. Uh, this is our first segment on this topic of the importance of culture and family business. And our program today is taking us to India and visiting with one of the true uh, giants in the world of family business and culture. And I hope you will enjoy it as much as um, we think you will. Um, our tour guide and special guest today is Mr. Subramanian Ramadori, the former managing director and CEO of Tata Consulting, Consultant Services. TCS is one of the largest companies in India and a world leader in the field of IT consulting services. Today, this is a $200 billion industry in India and TCS is one of the leaders of it. Uh, Ram is a public figure in, both, in, in India, both for his leadership role at TCS and for his important, very important public service engagements with the government of India. Um, most speakers we have here, we say he needs no introduction, and certainly in India, Ram would need no introduction, but for this purpose, I think it's good to have some background on him. Ram is a recipient of many major recognition awards. He is the recipient of the Padma Bhushan, which is one of the highest civilian awards in India. He has uh, been designated by none other than Her Majesty, the Queen of England, as, as a commander of the Order of the British Empire. And the Economic Times of India has given him the Lifetime Achievement Award, which is truly extraordinary. My Contact with Ram came about because of a fabulous book he wrote that I want to make sure everybody knows about. It's called The T TCS Story and Beyond. Um, this is just a remarkable um, discussion by Ram of this uh, exponential, the birth, exponential growth of not only uh, a company as part of the Tata Group, TCS, but also of the entire IT consulting services industry in India. And what's, what's fascinating is Ram realized early on that the success of TCS was very dependent on the success of building out the, the consulting, IT consulting uh, competencies in the education system in India. So he has been really a father of the, uh, of the building of this truly remarkable industry that's now one of India's most important. Ram and his wife Mala have been married just about 50 years and live in Mumbai. Mala is with us today and we're delighted to have her. They have one son who is a professor of financial economics at Imperial College in London and they have two grandchildren. I, my guess with COVID they're not seeing them so much but soon we'll all be seeing our family members so uh, we look forward to that. 
A fun fact about Rom is that he loves cricket. And I was talking to him last week, and he was giddy over the recent win by the uh, India team over uh, the Aussies um, in what's called the five-day test, which is a, believe it or not, it's a game played over five days. And in a comeback victory, the Indian team beat Australia the first time that Australia has lost in 30 years on home turf. And I know literally every man, woman, and child and taxi driver in India was ecstatic over that victory. And probably, Ron, my guess is they're still celebrating. Um, Ram, it's, it's just a pleasure to have you here. Uh, we want to learn from you about the culture of Tata Group and the culture of TCS. Um, and, and before we do that, I'd love to have you share with the audience the, the, your, your views on the culture of your family, how you grew up, and how that influenced your career, because I know Family in India is uh, is as important as anywhere, maybe more. And your family had a tremendous influence on how you uh, took the journey you took. So could you start with that, and then we'll turn to Tata Group and TCS. Good morning, uh, Spencer, and all of you. Thank you so much for that uh, generous introduction. I think you're absolutely right uh, that uh, we were celebrating the Indian win against the Aussies, which is very rare, but then the younger team has the motivation, passion to achieve something beyond the obvious. I think the family journey in India, especially in the time you grew up, has a lot of uh, influence your parents to start with and the siblings, your brothers, sisters, and also the extended family, your cousins, etc. So I think my father being a civil servant, what they call as the Indian Audit and Account Service, he used to teach us quite a bit of mathematics, physics, and some of the other scriptures where the family grew up in an environment of strict discipline, more importantly, the value systems, respect for the elders, and then focusing on learning and knowledge building in the early years. They introduced us to a number of teachers who in the school used to teach us extensively some of the subjects I articulated, including music or a dance, which was a way of life, especially for the girl child, and my sisters learned that. Those influences percolated into my taking an interest in music, but not singing really, but more importantly, in appreciating the nuances of music and language proficiency, whether it was Tamil or Sanskrit was again encouraged beyond the English, mathematics, et cetera, et cetera. I think the influence of the family, the uh, siblings, and the extended family, like I said, and the teachers, of course, played in a very, very critical role. And being the civil servant, we all lived in a colony or a set of houses which were allotted depending upon the hierarchy in the bureaucracy itself. So again, you built a lot of friends of similar middle class uh, upbringing who came from different parts of the country, but more importantly, living in Delhi gave us a view of the national capital, and that's where I spent most of the time, including my schooling, college, till the undergraduate in physics, which I did from the Delhi University, before I branched out to Bangalore, the Indian Institute of Science for Electrical Communication Engineering, then worked for a year at the one of the uh, physical research laboratories in a city called Ahmedabad, up in the West, then finally went to UCLA for my master's in computer science, then joined the great computer company NCR, which was the number two or number three company after IBM, Burroughs, and NCR. Finally, Tata's offered me a job, and that's when I decided to come back in the year 1972. That's how my journey has been from the time I was born and grew up with the family influence. Um, the, the, I must say I'm in awe of your educational background and the anchoring um, 
to science. One thing you left out of your um, description of your childhood is you got in trouble a lot. I was really surprised to hear that. <laughs> it gave me some uh, consolation that, uh, hey, even kids that have a little problem can, can make their way ahead as you have, but uh, congratulations on all that. I wanted to ask you about the... Um, the UCLA experience and this this coming to the United States and then going back to India. And um, I want to do a shout out here for Mala. I, my understanding was that while you were at UCLA and you were working for NCR and everything was great, uh, your parents um, apparently arranged um, um, an introduction, maybe, maybe more, to a, a beautiful lady. And um, she apparently laid down the law that if you didn't return to um, to India, um, there wasn't going to be a marriage. Could you comment on that? No, my comment is, um, one is <laughs> I always uh, wanted to come back to India. And the um, passion to come back and do something after a great learning, great learning experience and a work experience in the US was very, very critical. The more important thing is when I was introduced to Mala, and then uh, it only accelerated the process of coming back and then determination to spend time with her here. So I think it's a common purpose of uh, integrating the two families and a way of uh, looking at the future, my risk taking and then uh, growing up together most we, what we believed in. And she had a lot of influence in making that happen, I must and, say. And yeah, and she's had a lot of influence on your career, which we'll we'll get into later, hopefully. So let's turn to um, Tata Group, which you joined when you when you um, returned to India and became uh, married. Um, let me I'm going to put up a, a slide here um, to give us a little background on this. Um, bear with me. Here it comes. Um, so in your book, you make the comment, and I, I think this is a great way to start this off for our U.S. audience that, that may be uh, less familiar with this extraordinary company that you joined. But the, 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 the exact words uh, were in your book, uh, Tata is no ordinary business enterprise. That was one comment. And the other comment you made, I wanted to contribute something to India and its legacy. So with that, talk about Tata Group and what it meant to you and what it means today. I think when we grew up in India, beyond the government jobs or government as a port of call for nation building, the Tata Group stood the tallest amongst all the companies within the country itself starting from the freedom struggle to how they supported the freedom movement to the founders um, value system where he said, in a free enterprise, the community is not just another stakeholder in business, but it is in fact the very purpose of its existence. This is what he said in the year 1868, and that's how the Tata group was formed with completely different areas where we really cherish this and a job with the Tata Group, irrespective of the company or some aspirational position where you wanted to start your career. This was further reinforced by the group chairman, whom we all knew, Mr. Jamshed J. Tata, who essentially said the following, the cycle is thus complete what comes from the people has gone back to the people many times over, which means you generate wealth, but share that wealth multiple times for common good. And the ownership itself was 66% of the wealth was owned by the trust and the four trusts which make up people to go for higher education in terms of scholarships, quite a few of them went to the US or Cambridge or Oxford in the UK. And that is still very much prevalent through the JN Tata Endowment Trust. The second trust, uh, the Dorabji Tata Trust or the Ratan Tata Trust, these fund, uh, fund 
quite a bit of uh, healthcare initiative, cancer research, water, climate change. These are some of the areas which we have gotten into. But the very purpose of forming this group was to share the wealth and beyond the stakeholders, the community as one central piece of this whole thing. That's what attracted all of us to this group. And being a part of this group, the culture or the ingredient in your choosing this group was you're going to abide by this and practice that more than abiding by it and sharing it with all the people you come in contact with beyond, like I said, beyond the company, beyond its executives and including the community in the whole process. That's how we grew up. That's how we learned and that's how we practiced and that's how we percolated it. I think, I mean, it's, it's just an extraordinary um, example of, um, of, um, of profound philanthropy um, anywhere in the world, obviously. Um, I, I, just for the benefit of our audience, could you comment on and the, the, this concept of a group of companies is, is not, uh, not prevalent in the United States, but, but India, where family businesses over 90% of, the, of the, the corporate world there. Well, well, talk a little bit about a group and how, how different they are, not, not at length, but just sort of give people a perspective on the different groups that, that are there and, and the size of these companies. Yeah, you see the uh, Tata Group is comprised of over 100 operating businesses, of which 29 of which are publicly listed. These are in the areas of uh, one of the earliest in terms of um, textiles called the Empress Mills, which started in uh, Nagpur in the middle of the country, but then followed it with the power, hydroelectric power generation and distribution for the city of Mumbai. Third was in the steel business, which was in the east of the country, when the Britishers thought we could not uh, import steel or we could not produce steel and the original founder said, we are going to start a steel business where the iron ore was available. And then the Tata Automotive or Tata Motors as it is called, which was in the commercial vehicles as well as they branched into the uh, passenger vehicles, combination of both commercial vehicle and passenger vehicles. And now they are working on areas like electro, uh, EVs as well as looking at hydrogen as a fuel for the future. So I think they were far ahead of its times. And these are some of the business in addition to Tata Chemicals, Tata Consultancy Services, which I was a part of, or some of the others. But the large companies were in the manufacturing space, automotive and steel to start with, and then the chemicals. I think uh, this is what made the group what it is far ahead of its time. The labor practices were far ahead of what the government of India brought in, including the long-term benefit, which we call as the Provident Fund and welfare of the community and welfare of the people was it uh, was done. The group has been organized in the recent years into multiple areas like uh, telecommunications and information technology, areas like consumer products, areas like materials where the steel is a part of that, areas like uh, automotive and manufacturing and defense related activities and uh, the um, education, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we have classified the group in seven or eight categories under which each of them come. Some of them are listed as it is mentioned there. And the listed companies are their own set of uh, board of directors. Representation from the group is uh, there. 50% of the board of directors are from the group and 50% are independent directors, including women directors, which have been made compulsory over the years. I think the professional competence and the professional behavior and the professional operations overseeing the governance is what drives this group with the family having allocated all their wealth in terms of 66% to the trust, as I said, is just a custodian rather than a controller of any sort. That's what makes us the most exciting group in the country and continues this way, even with the change of the guard at different levels and no different from TCS, what we created, where we started in 1968, 100 years from the first operation, 1868. And the second thing was, we have had in the history of the company, namely TCS, four CEOs in the span of 51, 52 years, 
<laughs> and the first one was uh, Mr. F.C. Kohli, followed by me, followed by Chandra Shekharan, or Chandra as he's called, who is the current group chairman, followed by Rajesh Gopinath, who drives TCS today. I think that shows the continuity, the stability, sustainability of a corporation. But the inherent strength of the group is in caring for nature, caring for community, caring for every stakeholder and making sure you are transparent and you disclose everything through a set of governance and independent board of directors. The common theme across the group is the Tata business excellence model, which ensures that we practice the systems, processes, methodologies, and measurement systems, which we have to publish every year and we are measured on that basis. That's the history and that's what is taken, you know, taken forward. It's, uh, it's, it's quite a story, and, and I know uh, the mission statement, which is on the screen there, uh, this idea of leadership with trust um, is so profound and goes to the really the heart of the culture uh, of, of really every member of the, of the Tata group. I would, it, it, it's just such a daunting concept, the idea of 100 businesses, 29 of which are publicly traded with public stockholders, maybe comment on, on, on how you keep that culture that you described that's so strong with publicly traded companies uh, that are, have the demands of the public stockholders and the like. What, how, how is that done? I think if you look at the um, annual general body meetings in this country, typically they run for about three to four years, four hours. And it's one of the most testing times for the board of directors, including the chairman and the independent directors and the CEO and managing director of the companies. You won't believe when we listed in 2004 as TCS, just as an example, we went from one shareholder, namely Tata Sons, who was the owner of TCS, to 1.1 million shareholders on the day after the listing. <laughs> We are talking about one shareholder to 1.1 million shareholders. The responsibility that is thrust on the CEO and MD is the accountability, transparency, and you are in public, um, public uh, you are uh, visible to the public. I think that makes sure that you understand what leadership trust means, what you say means what you practice, and what you practice results in a set of actions, including building a leadership team. And their behavior is a whole honing process, which starts from initially absorbing the culture of the Tata group itself, like I said, when we grew up, to being a part of this, to building and nurturing that continuously through a set of leadership practices, which we do through mentoring, mentor mentee, mentee relationships, you build on it and you scale it as you go along and leave it for the successor to practice the same set of values. I think it is an ecosystem of a sort which you build across all the companies with the board of directors, with the chairman, with the CEO and MD. From day one, we have more or less always separated the CEO and MD position and the chairman's position. And the chairman could be a completely, the group chairman uh, passed, but nowadays we are even having independent directors as chairman of some of the companies. I think the measurement is what kept us going and the digital technology with regard to the measurement system and the quality and accuracy of the data kept us the ability to scale up. And finally, when I retired after 2014, even though I'm in a number of the Tata Group companies, which are predominantly in the philanthropy, whether it is education, whether it is health, whether it is uh, social uh, sciences, I think you get a much better outside in view. Having been a practitioner for 40, 45 years, now you are going to get the outside in view of the same group where you were inside and part of the inside uh, network. I think uh, you met people a lot one-on-one. -on -one. You met people as a group. You do a lot of webinars these days, and you did a lot of open houses. So you're always in the public gaze, and these AGMs, like I said, the shareholders virtually ask you some of the most awkward questions. <laughs> Honest thing, like I didn't get the annual report, which was in physical form, 
and you have to apologize to say that it was a mistake and we'll correct it and make sure the company secretary sends you the annual report the next time. So I think these are the ways we have to learn to the feedback, immediately act upon it and disclose the right things and never say no to your customer. So each shareholder is a customer on that day and you cannot say anything to a customer where if it's demands are more, you better accept it because he's only raising the bar for you and building an institution which is going to be long lasting. That's the way we do that. That's a, it's such a, such an impressive uh, such an impressive uh, story and discipline to follow through. A, a, a question that comes up uh, often is that I'd ask you: Does is Tata Group viewed as a family business in India? So you have you have the ownership by the charitable trust, which of course were established by the Tata family. Uh, Ratan Tata is a is a major public figure like you are, um, and uh, and I'm just wondering. Is there, are there Tatas, this is different in the United States where family businesses they have all kinds of family members in different parts of the business. But my understanding is they're, they're really, the, the, the Tata family itself is quite small relative to this enormous business. And I just wondered uh, how is, is the, the governance of the trust uh, strong enough to carry this forward? I, my, I, I think I know the answer, but I'd love to have your observation on that. I think the group is in a way a family, a family of multiple companies, a family which uh, chooses its professional competencies above everything else. A group has no wish that a family person has to be part of the group or part of the company. And uh, the independent directors are again, as I said, completely from outside with their capabilities, with their professional competencies and ability in different areas, whether it is finance, whether it is social obligations, whether it is disclosures, whether it is transparency, they challenge you on everything. So we choose them very, very carefully. And even the independent directors want to be part of this group. And that should be the post, uh, first port of call for any aspiring independent director. I think uh, the value family system, like I said, because you have grown up the way which I articulated from early days, to the family after you get married, to the way you transfer that to your children and then pick it up from outside. It's not that everything you learn from within. For example, let me give you some examples of the companies I dealt with. We might learned a lot from the US, for example. IBM as a corporation in the early days when we grew up was a benchmark. IBM was a family business where a grandfather, a father, or a son would be part of the same corporation as an example. Today, we can find that kind of a pattern in Tatas where the father or the son or the sister or the brother would also be part of this uh, company. They may be in TCA, they may be in another part of the group itself, but that's very, very prevalent. Second thing I learned, for example, from Hewlett Packard, which was one of the topmost companies in those days, where if you wanted the phenomenal products and the product engineering and the benchmark for engineering, that's the kind of learnings we did from that kind of a company. The Malcolm Baldrige Award, that's the one which we learned and practiced with regard to the JRDQV or the Tata Business Excellence Model as an example. So we are absolutely keen to learn not only from global corporations, but also from the universities by being a part of those and then bringing some of those capabilities, knowledge for common good. I think these are some things which binds the group, binds the companies, binds the people in these groups as a family and the extended family, which you must have seen in the book itself, the Maitri, which uh, Mara started and the ability for the spouses to contribute to the family well-being or the group well-being was very much encouraged. I think that's another uh, common trait most of the CEOs or most of the leadership team with their spouses would always participate in the events of the company. And in some cases, both the husband and wife may also be part of the same company in different parts of the organization. But this is the way the group has practiced and this is the way we encourage and this is the way we would like to carry it forward so that there is a common thread and then application of all the good governing principles as it evolves over a period of time is always practiced. The regulators, in fact, I think learn from us rather than measure us from the point of view, have you violated any law or anything? So that is the benchmark that they are sticking with this group is considered.
That, I mean, it's such a it's it's so remarkable, and and and, and kudos to uh, Mala for the Matri prayer. The word Matri uh, in Hindu it, it means family, and so this was a, an entire program to link the spouses and the families together with with the company, uh, which, given the travel demands and the work uh, at TCS, was was really critical to keep it keep it as one one. Um, uh, happy family, as, as they say. Let's turn to... Uh, one of to... the... Sorry, Spencer, I forgot to mention one other thing. My earliest visit to your city was in 1985 when I visited the McDonnell Douglas Corporation. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And McDonnell Douglas Corporation is one of the unique engineering products called Unigraphics. Initially, it was called something else, but ultimately, it became Unigraphics when it was spun out. And we signed the contract to distribute the Unigraphics products in India in 1985. Oh, wow. That's something which I cherish a lot because I visited along with Mr. Kohli, whose photographs are still in my album, signing that contract in St. Louis. That is great. And of course, uh, McDonnell Douglas is a, is a heralded family business. So we, we can, that's a whole other discussion, but it's a great family business that was, that was founded here in St. Louis. Um, I'm trying to get to, to my next slide, but for some reason I'm stuck here. I don't know why I am. Um, let me go back. I want to turn to TCS. We'll do that anyway. Let me see if I can get back to that. Um, TCS is a fascinating uh, situation in that it was a startup inside um, of, of the Tata Group. And like most of the other Tata companies, let's see if I can get this to move. I can't get this to move. I'm sorry, so I'll stop that. Um, but but TCS um, was was a was a startup within the Tata Group, and you and 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 Mr. Coley, who who is viewed by everyone as sort of the father of the IT services industry in India, and you I guess you're the son of the father of the IT services industry, services industry. But so it's within the Tata Group, but it 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 blossomed into this enormous company, which today um, uh, has has four hundred and sixty nine thousand employees, twenty two billion dollars in in revenues, uh, and in valuation, it is valued as one of the most valuable companies of, of any kind in the world, but certainly in in its space. I'm fascinated, uh, Ram, about culture at TCS. And as a startup, you have the traditional Tata Group culture, which is, um, as you describe, the Tata code of of, of integrity, transparency, um, and the like. Uh, you have leadership through trust, but you're in the technology business, and uh, you need innovation, and you need you need the latest in terms of how the technology market is moving. Did culture change at TCS to make it successful, or was it still anchored um, with the Tata Group culture? Are they similar? Or are they somewhat different? No, I think a little different for the simple reason. When we grew up, the TCS average age was 23 years. Wow. Whereas if you took uh, the Tata Steel or the Tata Motors, the average age would be minimum 45 to 50. So you're going to have different cultures because you're suddenly dealing with a very innovative, anxious, over-enthusiastic kids who want to perform at any cost. So the challenge for any leader is how do you bring them together? How do you bring some order to the chaotic possibilities of a young crowd? And that was the challenge which Mr. Kohli faced, but subsequently I had to continue with the same set of challenges. So I think the only way to address that is a collegiate atmosphere you need to create in a company like TCS and engage more without any hierarchy, which was prevalent in the other group companies, whether it's the steel or the automotive or the chemical or uh, the hotel business. But the single point of uh, commonality was always focus on what is right for the customer and what is right for the community at large. And every value system flows from that and every one of your employees has to be aligned to that. 
technology was a knowledge gathering where proactively you invest in the welfare of the people. It's very similar to a child. When a child grows up, if it's like myself, which you also said, very restless, you're going to throw a set of challenges which makes you focus on that rather than going to unproductive activities or destructive activities. So I think we did that by importing the set of computers which I've articulated in the book, importing a set of technologies and the learning and development environment which we created, and more importantly, the collegiate atmosphere and the collegiate behavior and walk into your office anytime, like a startup, we all grew up together to make what TCS was and the culture has luckily continued. And in my page 258 of the book, I have said, a CEO should be judged not by just what he built, but more importantly, what he leaves behind for his successor to build upon. So when I see the operating results of the last quarter and the last five years of the group, in terms of revenue, it has grown over the years in the last uh, 16 to 20 by about 10.6% CAGR. Operating margins in terms of operating profit has stayed between 26 and 25%, which means a net operating margin of 25% on a business is an amazing um, culture. Yes. Third is the earnings per share and the cash flow and the cash availability and the dividends to the um, shareholders. Last year, we gave 109% dividend to the shareholders in addition to what we gave to the Tata Sons, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the employee metrics, which you yourself articulated, and then the shareholder payouts, which I talked about. So I think that's the way you have to build and that's the way you have to sustain. And like I said, four CEOs in the history of the company with this kind of results on a sustainable basis with the value system and more concern about not economic value, but ecological value also is what we are pushing and what I'm measuring from outside instead of within the corporation itself. Ram, I, yeah, I, I'm hearkening back to conversations I've had preparing for this, talking to customers of TCS, as well as some of your top employees that your assist, your wonderful assistant, Radhika, was nice enough to introduce me to. Um, you're you're way too modest um, in terms of <laughs> what you did to achieve all this. But the the one thing that jumps out at me, and I, I just asked you to comment because I just think it's so interesting. Uh, Mr. Coley uh, uh, came over to the the IT consulting part of Tata Group in the early days from the I, I gather it was the, either the uh, the power company or it was sort of the electric grid company. And he was a, a towering man in knowledge and, and discipline. But your managerial style versus what was described with him was, was so different. And, um, and, I, and I, th I think that's, it, I mean, it seems to me that that's your, that's your, among other great things you've done, but your legacy is that, that collaborative, team-oriented, um, truth-seeking, no, 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 no victims, uh, no anger, um, humble, uh, but directionally confident uh, and goal oriented. That, that's what I think that's your greatest achievement at TCS and it lives. So I, I congratulate, you, but it, it maybe comment on Mr. Kohler because I think people, I mean, it must have been challenging. And then, of course, he designated you to run the company, which is fabulous. Well, he was a remarkable man in terms of his uh, quality of education, quality of thinking, the broadness of his vision. But he was, uh, to lack of a better word, he was not the greatest communicator. <laughs> <laughs> so he, is... he was a one-way communication where uh, you had to listen to him more than uh, respond to him. But I like I have described in my book, I learned to respond to him through notes written and then sent to him after every interaction with him. So we came very close because you can always communicate with a person by different styles. Some by verbal communication, some by gestures, some by notes, and some by traveling together. So that the affinity for you develops over a period of time, but you look beyond that person in terms of his heart and his intellectual capacity I don't think very few people will have that experience to learn something and that learning is what kept me going. In fact, jokingly, some of my colleagues used to say, 
How is it that you are able to go to his room and come back smiling because he <laughs> made... <laughs> so I mean, that's good. Uh, that's great. All those because we think we have some, done something wrong, and they would ask the person, his secretary outside, how is his mood before they went in. If the lady said he was not in the greatest of mood, they'll probably disappear and say we'll see him some other time. So <laughs> I think you have to deal with the personality like that. And those learnings also was a great learning, great learning from a person who had the intellectual capacity. And diverse subjects, diverse areas where he used to challenge us. And because I accepted the challenges with a can-do attitude, he threw more at me instead of saying that, uh, now you go and do on your own. That's I think a... that's the culture which I pushed without the, uh, the atmosphere where a person who sits in his chair behaves differently than a person who is outside. It has to be the same person and give the freedom for the people to talk. And the younger people, right or wrong, so long as they have the opportunity, you listen to them, you can build an institution. That's the way we scaled up, that's the way I practice the culture. What not to do, but at the same time, learn from that person some of the remarkable things he taught me. That is, uh, that is amazing. I'd like to, to ask you one uh, other question, and we'll go for to questions from the audience. Um, one thing that strikes me from the book was this this idea that I, I mentioned earlier that that TCS could not be successful unless the 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 infrastructure in India uh, grew with you. It's sort of um, it was this idea of of the need to scale up. You needed to scale up TCS. You had this this um, this huge uh, vision of top ten by two thousand ten, which you achieved, I think, several years earlier. You had a vision of a billion dollars in revenues, which you achieved earlier than you imagined. And then you're in later on, after the public offering in 2004, you had this vision of being in the top three in the world um, in your industry. With these, are, these are just extraordinary um, goal settings. But this idea that you, it wasn't just TCS that needed to scale up, but it was the the, the infrastructure in India, education system, access to talented people and the like. Um, could you talk a little bit about your relationship with the school systems? I'm thinking of the IITs and the, and the yeah. IISs. And also this, I thought it was fascinating, you, the, the establishment of the Tata Research uh, Design and Development Center in Pune. Um, I mean, you, you literally had to move the country so TCS could move forward. Maybe comment on that. I think uh, the environment in the country when you grew up was one of the most uh, strict regimes which allowed very little of imports. And the only way to check the imports was through an import licensing process, which could take anywhere from one year to a couple of years to the customs duties, the levies, which you had to pay as tariffs into the import of these equipment. On top of it, we had to give export obligation that you use the machine for productive purposes then you would export equivalent to two and a half times the landed cost of that machine and over a period of five years. These some were the challenges which against all odds we had to perform and we took those challenges. We had to build an industry, we had to build an institution. And that's what motivated us to come back or motivated us to work on it. As we built it, the backend integration, because what is the raw material for a company like ours? It's the human capital. Right. We had to source it from the universities, whether within the country and off late, both from India and outside the country. But then the readiness of these graduates to relate to the technology space we were operating in was the key thing. And that's what gave us the opportunity to have what we call as academic meets once a year, where we call about 100 to 150 heads of institutions. Today, it's a lot more where we meet with them over two or three days and then exchange notes with regard to what the industry needs, namely the customer, what we need as an R&D and what we need to go as an extended arm to the educational institutions through sabbaticals, through curriculum uh, changes, and more importantly, to take a view of the customer, the university graduates customer, the university's customer is uh, the employers. 
employers, customer is the end customer. So I think these linkages in the ecosystem creation took us a lot of time. And that's why they like what we did because ultimately every university, including yours, you want every single one of your graduates either to go into the family business or join businesses and nobody should be without a job or without an entrepreneurial ability to do what they want to do. So I think uh, that's what created the ecosystem and also the research center in Pune, which you have said, which I've articulated in my book with regard to not just an IT uh, research center, it was multiple areas, including the water filter I talk about, some of the other areas which we did in terms of mechanical engineering, some of the uh, supercomputer building which we did, and uh, some of the IT related, some of the automation tools which we did, so that when the year 2000 problem was there or when subsequent problems were there, we were able to give the productivity which was needed. How to do more with less was the mantra. How do you keep doing it through innovation? How do you do it through a set of challenges in interdisciplinary curriculum? How do you push back some of those things to the university research in collaboration or on their own? That's how we had to do and that's how we built and that's why we continue to do through what we call as a co-innovation network today where we are plugged into most of the leading universities of the world and we fund them, we work with them and they come here and they spend time with us. So it is a way of life for us and as of the last count, we have filed about 4,700 uh, patents, of which close to 1,000 have been granted over the years. Isn't that great? And I, I mean, you're recruiting, I mean, something like 40,000 people a year. So, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a daunting task to find the, the people and, and the related talent. Uh, a question that's come in from uh, a family business owner here is about your use of consultants. Um, I was struck uh, by just how important your strategy consultant was to you in, in formulating uh, this, this big vision of uh, top 10 by 2010 um, and your, your offsite strategy meetings that I thought it was fascinating. You went back to your, the, the IIS in, in Bangalore and, and that, was the, that was the institution that Jemsi Tata created back in 1909. I mean, what a, what a story that is. Uh, but but talk about um, you know your openness to to advice from third parties. You might add your MIT experience, which also was. I mean, to to achieve what you've achieved, you 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 had the best minds in the world uh, helping you, which is wonderful. I think that um, the MIT experience, which I went in 1993 for the executive MBA program was one of the most uh, cherishing moments and one of the most uh, key inputs in my uh, life. I think the way they did the nine-week curriculum with a field trip to Europe when the European Union was formed and also to the uh, company there, uh, the Honeywell people there, including Washington when the health policy of the Clinton administration was being formulated. So you met a number of congressmen, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the interdisciplinary nature of looking at problem solving is something which MIT taught us a lot more aggressively than we have learned as part of the Tata institution itself. So that forced me to look at completely dissimilar disciplines. But then what is the common thread and how do you challenge our researchers, challenge our employees to look at that? In the process, we also got, I have narrated in the book, Dr. Pankaj Kemawat, who was from the Harvard Business School. Subsequently, he went to Barcelona and that is where he's part of that management school. But then I kept him to make sure that we had a process-driven, consulting-driven, outcome-based, dealing with 40 people through the strategy sessions very rigorously once a month and documenting it to implement before the next meeting. So the strategy sessions and the behavioral changes which we had to bring in for a focused outcome-based interdisciplinary nature collaboration came out of some of those interactions. I think MIT also gave me the inputs with regard to if you didn't like a professor, if you didn't get the value for the money we have paid with the international students and the domestic students, we used to challenge and tell the Dean that this is 
has to be changed and we need more input from the industry or we needed more interest, uh, input from the academic community. So listening to the voice of the customer and making sure that you adopted some of those, again, I pushed it to the hilt so that those are some of the things which stays with the corporation. Customer direct, customer first, and the bosses and the hierarchy much later. Hierarchy is the set of bringing in the governance, but a hierarchy is not the practice. The customer and empowering the employees to focus on the customer is a culture which has developed over the years. Interesting. Um, I got a question from the audience, which I think is really uh, a really great one. It, it reads, your values all reflect a commitment to shared prosperity. In the highly individualistic culture of the United States, how would you recommend we cultivate this lens among leaders and teams in this country? And I, what a great question. Um, it's it, the idea is the contrast between the culture of India and the shared prosperity. And given your experience in the United States, which is which is vast, uh, how how do we how do we do that with our culture? I think uh, you've got to look back at your own corporations, your own universities, and the culture is very much written there, how they practice the collaboration, how the products came out or the services came out. I think there are enough examples and enough uh, case studies for us to learn from that, not only for US benefit, for global benefit. I think America, in my opinion, is the mecca of thought leadership mecca of ideas which can be translated into products for the consumers at large. And without collaboration, it's just not possible. Somewhere along the line, the measurement systems have got skewed where the wealth is the measurement before the product or the impact that product is going to make for the humanity at large. You can bring that and the climate change is one classic example, which is bringing all of us to a common good the pollution, the dumping on the oceans, all of these and the healthcare and the COVID-19 as we see it in front of our eyes are bringing to that kind of a value system and a collaboration and a common good and learnings together. I think if you just look back at that itself, you will see which is good, whether wealth creation or the separation between wealth creation and a common good and the disparity in the income levels between the haves and the have not. These are some things which we have to practice day in and day out. And the young professionals whom we are going to leave for the next generation, they want that and they are demanding it. And the social media is a great leveler. And I'm sure we can do that so long as the social media is practiced for good. That's very good. I have one, I have, with the time running out here, I have one final question. This is kind of fun. This is a, uh, a student of ours that, uh, that worked at Bombay House with Mr. Jamwal for four and a half years before going to business school. And he apparently worked indirectly for you, Ram, at the Public Health Foundation of India. His question is, uh, what are some of your favorite uh, memories of working with Mr. Ratan Tata? I think the favorite memory, I think it will be a very humorous one. Both of us decided to go to South America. <laughs> And when we wanted to go to South America, we decided to go from uh, Bombay down to Johannesburg and then from Johannesburg to a direct flight to Sao Paulo. I think, uh, lo and behold, we were there and at the Johannesburg airport, Mr. Tata was told, you don't have a visa to get into this country. <laughs> and you have got to cool your heels at the airport itself while Mr. Ramdare has the visa and he can be let go. So I came out of the airport and I had so much of bouquets which were for, meant for Mr. Tata, but I had to receive those bouquets. And Mr. Tata had to take the shower in the airport and wait for the next flight to be caught. I thought he would be so upset with his office for making sure that his visa was invalid or visa had expired. But I think he took it in its spirit. And then uh, that was one very, very hilarious moment for us. That is oh, think, that's so uh, great. That's the other wonderful. time we went on the road trips together, where before the IPO in 2003, 2004, these road shows are like a drama. Yes. The people you interact with, the investment bankers think they know your business better than you know your business. So they advise you a lot with the proviso that they want at the lowest price so that they can maximize their earnings going forward. 
and that's what they did. And uh, when we went for these road shows, myself, Mr. Tata, and uh, uh, the Paddy, whom I talked about in the book itself, were the one group, the group finance director, Chandra, and uh, Mr. Malingam, and the other people who were in the other lot. We went to Singapore, we went to the US, we went to multiple cities in the US, Canada, and then came back through Hong Kong, et cetera. I think these were some fun moments where you see the person beyond the corporate uh, hierarchy. You know how you understand, how you deal with a person and how you interact with a person. And the people at large, our customers or our employees in any of these locations also felt so good to meet with him because they had made sure that as part of the agenda, in addition to meeting the potential investors, he had to meet with the employees and he cherished those moments. So I think these are some things which we did. I think rarely, I think uh, as a boss, whether it was Mr. Kohli or Mr. Tata or Mr. Pankiwala, whom I talk about, have lost their cool on me at least, or have allowed them to lose their cool with any of my employees. Isn't that great? Well, what a, what a, what a, what a great story. I want to um, recommend uh, a, a second time, uh, people read this extraordinary book about this journey uh, from startup to one of the largest companies in, in the world with an incredible culture, one that's uh, the envy of everyone. And I also wanted to, um, to thank uh, Ram, your, your team there. Uh, Radhika has been great working with us to make this happen. Then of course, Mala, who without her, we wouldn't have you. Um, you, you'd be in Los Angeles somewhere, I think is where you'd be. Uh, probably very <laughs> successful, I, I might add. But at any rate, uh, and I finally, obviously, I want to thank you for your, your gracious uh, way and your wonderful presentation about not only the culture of Tata Group but, and TCS, but about the family culture of India, which really is a, is a model. And this idea of uh, shared prosperity um, is, um, is something we, 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 sh we all hope we can achieve someday. And in this COVID environment, it's become even more uh, significant to think about. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll bring this portion of the program to a close, uh, but thank you, Ram, for a, a wonderful discussion and so many great insights. I'll turn the program now back to uh, Bart Hamilton. Thank you, Bart. Thank you so much, Spencer and your entire team. It would not be possible because of uh, the way you made sure that the digital environment played for us. And uh, I must thank your team as well as my team for sure, including my wife, Mala. But thank you so much for making this possible. It has been a great interaction and I look forward to visiting your uh, campus one of these days. That'd be wonderful. Ram, you're always welcome there. Thank you, appreciate it and be safe, okay? Thanks. Bart, over to you. Great, thank you, Spencer and Mr. Ramador. I just, it's an honor to have you speak to us uh, here and it's really uh, amazing the number of insights I think we've learned uh, over the past hour. And I would also say, I can't recommend your book uh, highly enough. Really, really lots of different insights about not only TCS, but I think learnings for uh, people running other uh, organizations, both abroad and here in the United States. So thank you so much. And thank you, Spencer, for uh, leading the conversation. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to switch over to uh, my colleague Peter Baumgarten, who's going to lead a panel discussion reflecting on um, the insights that we heard about um, in the last hour and how that might apply to um, their businesses or issues in the United States and, and elsewhere. Uh, Peter, I'll let you introduce your panel. Great. Thank you, Bart. I am incredibly excited about the way that we've structured this next month, in large part because this, the goal of this particular symposium in its extended format is to be able to listen to leaders and then also to engage with leaders uh, downstream. And our panel right here is a perfect example of that. So as you see, for the next three weeks, we'll have the same sort of formats that we can continue to engage in these forms of questions and then spend some time talking to folks like we have here, Mark and Seth, who are going to elucidate some various different insights both on what they know about this space, what they heard in the particular symposium, and its implications for you all inside your own organizations. As you know, um, the mission here at the Koch Center is to engage the next generation of family business leaders and to connect them with resources that they need to succeed. And some of those resources are ideas or themes that you might be able to pull back into your own organizations. So with that said, I wanna introduce our panel here today. 
Uh, we have uh, two distinguished individuals joining us. The first is Mark Leaker. Uh, Mark is the Senior Managing Director of St. Louis's Harbor Group, a privately owned holding company headquartered here in St. Louis. All total, Mark has had a 30-year career in M&A, including 10 years at PwC, serving uh, most recently before that as a senior manager of their M&A group out of the London office. At Harbor, he's a member of the executive committee and board and leads the investment and corporate development activities. Mark is a St. Louis native and is involved in a number of community organizations, including the current board member and past chair of the Gateway Region YMCA. Uh, welcome, Mark. Great to have you here. Um, our second panelist is going to be Seth Carnahan. Seth is my colleague over in the strategy group. He's an associate professor in strategy and entrepreneurship at Olin's Business School. Prior to entering um, uh, the academy, he worked as a CPA in Deloitte St. Louis office. Uh, he also, to my um, interest, grew up working in a small family business, a discount jewelry business run by his mom. I should be asking you, Seth, is your mom here on the line today? No, I, I, she, she's since retired, so it's, uh, it, it'd be hard for me to, uh, to peel her away from uh, her other pursuits to, uh, to, to listen to uh, me and my, my colleagues <laughs> bloviate about what we think is interesting, right? So yeah, but that, that, was, uh, that was a formative experience for me. Well, that's, that's fair. And uh, Seth, your research obviously um, examines issues around entrepreneurship and human capital in various different stripes. So I think we'll have a really robust discussion here around the way that uh, we heard some things from Ram and how they might apply to organizations that are represented here on the particular call. So I'm going to start out broadly by asking what stood out to each of you about the discussion we just heard. What most surprised you, intrigued you, resonated with your view of the world? Uh, Mark, why don't we start with you? Um, having just recently heard Ram walk through a number of different themes, what stood out to you in your work? Well, it's interesting. I uh, I started to take notes at each thing he said that was that was noteworthy, and I, I filled the page because I think I could comment on just about everything that he said. But there, there was a couple things that really jumped out to me. One was was really. Uh, about the transition. It, it's it's not, you know, where they have ended up is amazing, but the transition that he talked about to go from one shareholder to a million shareholders, to go from uh, this sort of corporate organization to this community focus, um, from family to group, from profit to community, to use innovation, to do more with less, um, in in my line of work, it is these transitions where you often find that organizations end up selling their business. Um, so I, I just found it interesting that they were able to make that jump. And so much of what he talked about was the transition. Um, and then a couple other things that he just said that that I, I think was, was really interesting. Um, you know, utilization of the best minds in the world. Uh, accepting challenges with a can-do attitude, um, the comment about it's not what a CEO, not only what a CEO builds, but what's left for the next generation to build upon. So there were just so many thoughts in there that ring so true uh, in so many ways as family businesses and corporations in the U.S. deal with with what they did, and then and then the whole idea of how would it really work in the U.S. to to uh, another question that somebody raised about an, can an organization in the U.S. today with the focus on shareholder value and building wealth and earnings really get this sort of benevolent focus that they have? Uh, there would be some very big challenges at many levels to get there. I think it's possible, but uh, it's, it's amazing that they did that as a private family business because if you could imagine some of the companies today trying to do that on their own, it would be incredibly challenging. Well, Mark, we're going to come back to a couple of those themes around social impact and how organizations might do it a yep. bit later on. Yep. I do want to just follow up on one particular point here. You said there's these moments of transition when we're, we have done things in a previous way and we're now trying to do it in a slightly new way, that that creates this impetus at times to sell. From the owner's perspective, is it a realization that they just can't handle that continuity? Is it the pain points that are emerging in the midst of the need for transition? What kind of spurs on this need to sell in these points of transition? Well, I, I, you just named a few, but I think that that uh, Mr. Ramadori made a very key point. When they went from one shareholder to a million shareholders, that, that's an amazing statement about the people involved. 
Well, that transition from first generation to second generation in a business is difficult. And then when you start to go beyond that, and there has to be some ability to loosen the reins and that oftentimes very involved, very controlling owner, senior management team that feels like it's moving away from them a little bit. I'm always amazed at their inability to gain outside leadership and bring in the best minds in the world, maybe hire a non-family management team. And so in that transition, I think oftentimes they just default to let's put the money in a trust. Let's sell the business. Let's capitalize on the asset and let's ensure the future for multiple generations. Um, but but they, the easy solution, if you will, sort of the you know, hit the easy button is to bring in a banker, have a process and sell the business. Yeah. I thought that openness to change and learning was interesting. How do we learn from IBM? How do we learn from HP? How do we learn from additional family members that marry into the organization, all being areas for spurring on our view of the world? Seth, over to you. What stood out to you from the perspective of either your son of a family business owner or strategy hat that you might wear today? Uh, completely. So uh, a couple of things stood out to me and, and just kind of building on what, on what Mark said before, I, I also was fascinated by the fact that uh, TCS went from being small to being very large. And, and it caused me to reflect on some of the institutional differences between the US and India, as I'm sure a lot of us were doing, especially the, the Americans in the audience here thinking about the, the lessons that could be applied from TCS to the US. And it made me think that you know maybe there is some downside to the really thick uh, equity markets that we have in the United States, where it's pretty easy to push the easy button, like Mark is saying, and sell to a uh, to, to to another uh, to another player. Whereas I I'd, be, I'd love to ask uh, Mr. Ramadori if they really even had that option or what the kind of the uh, the choice that they had when they were when they were at TCS, because it seems like they I don't know that they were restricted per se, but they had a different kind of uh, institutional environment that maybe didn't make that easy button quite quite so simple, and it forced them maybe to grow and really tr- make this transition from being small to medium to, to very large. Whereas in the U.S., I think you know we see this so often the the, the exit that most entrepreneurs are looking for is is uh, is M and A rather than uh, than IPO these days. Uh, so I thought that that was that was really 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 interesting, and I wanted to to ask him more questions about that. And then um, just a, a little bit a little bit different. I, the thing that really stood out to me. And this isn't that unusual, but it it's it still really spoke to me was the relentless customer focus that that he had. And it wasn't so much that he was just focused on his end customer, but he was also focused on himself as a customer, which I thought was fascinating. So he looked at himself as sort of a hub between his end customer and say like his uh, suppliers in some ways, like these other institutions like the IITs and and so on. And he had this relentless customer focus about how can the down, how can I create play, uh, value for my customers? And also, how can I make sure that people are creating value for me? And that also came out in his discussion about MIT and how he and the other students, uh, you know, advocated with the dean to make sure that they were getting uh, what they paid for. And I, I just thought that that um, his, his willingness to, to be very clear and demanding, while also having this uh, broad, uh, very uh, pro social kind of approach, I thought the marrying of that was very, very powerful. And I think that might be something that's that's responsible for, for their success, kind of pro-social uh, point of view, but very, very relentless focus on getting what you paid for and being clear and demanding and having objectives and focusing on uh, uh, value creation. So Seth, I wanna build upon a point that you just mentioned there. So looking at yourself as a customer, if you had one of our executive MBAs or MBAs or even a business owner from the community say, I heard you mention this point about seeing yourself as a customer, and I'm curious what that would look like operationalized into my day-to-day life. What would you encourage them to do differently as a result of that mentality? Oh, I think I think measurement is really the key, the, really the key thing here, and just and evaluating existing relationships. I think so many of us uh, get into a rut where we tend to work with the folks that we've worked with in the past, and there's some interesting research here that suggests that you know while working with prior relationships, working with uh, you know, uh, uh, suppliers that we've worked with in the past can be valuable, it can be comfortable. Oftentimes it can slip into suboptimal performance. And so being willing to have difficult conversations with uh, suppliers who maybe have become sort of like quasi family members and trying to make sure that you're uh, getting the value uh, 
economically that you that you need in addition to kind of the social value you get from the relationship i think sometimes we focus on that consuming that kind of like uh, interpersonal familiarity with folks rather than the uh, kind of brass tacks uh, bottom line kind of uh, uh, performance that that is that is sometimes necessary and can kind of slip away especially in you know smaller businesses where relationships are such uh, the focus of day-to-day -day life Okay. So I, I want to focus on this idea around continuity and change for a bit. In fact, both of you mentioned this in your remarks, that this ability to change while maintaining some continuity to the core uh, elements of who Tata and TCS is makes this particular story unique. Mark, I'm going to volley it over to you first. When you see organizations that do this transition well of various different stripes, what are some of the red threads that hold it together? You mentioned a few already around outside perspectives and the like, but what are some of the things that you see helping organizations go through a need for change while maintaining a core of who they are? Yeah, I think oftentimes, and, and this is what's, what's lost, and I think what we just heard that Tata did so well, which is it, it, it always comes down to the people and the ability to have uh, future generations, the ability to have a culture that is recognized and known so that as you go through those changes, you can always fall back on what it is that you do. What's your central core? Uh, I think that so often when we see people not succeed at this it is because they're trying to do it in a very insulated world. You have a group, a very senior group that is often of the same age. They're often of the same thought process. And they're trying to make these decisions in a universe of one or two or three, oftentimes a family uh, with a very limited outside scope. Whereas those organizations that look at it across not only their own family generations, but multi levels of the organization from an age and experience, um, from a capabilities, from uh, I, I think you heard him mention average age in TCS 23, 24, average age in Tata. 4550, right? Very interesting point. And if you think about transitioning your business with all of the insights of the organization, which means, and this is the really challenging thing for private businesses, you have to open up. And that becomes very difficult for organizations that have made the decisions in a very tight circle for a long time. So I think that just that ability to reach into the organization, build a culture, and then know that culture can transition, no matter what your shareholdings are. They went to 66% into a charitable organization. They went through an IPO, but they kept that central focus on what was the core and what was the culture. And they had built that before they had a structural change in their shareholdings. And so who owned it and how it was built didn't, as matter, didn't matter as much about what do we do every day and how do we do it. So is there something about a type of humility that is required on the part of leaders to say, we need outside perspectives, we need different voices, we need to listen to the young people in our organizations. What, what are the characteristics, the personality traits, the organizational culture pieces that enable that very difficult thing to happen inside family-owned organizations? Well, when we see this in businesses where that successful transition is happening or there is this culture, one of the things that jumps right off the page all the time is transparency. Uh, their ability to have uh, people know what's happening, whether it's a profitability perspective, a decision-making perspective, uh, multiple levels of an organization can come into a meeting, feel free to give their view, not be afraid of the backlash, um, believe that they're being heard, how they're being heard. So that transparency and that culture, we see it in successful organizations, and it, it's just it's, it's so repeated that that is something that helps build that ability and that humility, as you said. If you can't have that transparency and that humility, thinking that you can successfully get through this type of what is really transformational. And you remember when you're talking about these family businesses in second or third generation, it, it's, it's like a, it, it's, there's so much emotion tied up into it. It's like a, I and mean, people say it, it's like a baby, right? It's like, you know, this is something your grandfather may have started and your father built, and now it's in your hands. So thinking that you may change that, you know, there's a, there is just so much sensitivity around it that it becomes very difficult. Yeah. 
Seth, I, I'm curious your take. So you spent a good bit of time in the literature. You know a good bit about how organizations might need to balance this dimension around continuity and change. I know you've even looked at professional service firms and some of their transitions over time. What can we learn from the academic literature around what organizations can do to thread this needle well? Yeah, I think, I think one example that really highlights uh, some, maybe some best practices is IBM. And so Mr. Ramadori uh, brought them up and, I, and that really resonated with me because uh, I think a lot of Americans don't realize that IBM was a, was a family business. And in the 1950s, IBM had this really, really difficult hinge point where they had been the, the big dog in mechanical computing, sort of punch cards. And, uh, you know, it's not electric or, or analog or mechanical computing punch cards going through these big machines and, you know, a very, very, uh, very uh, mechanical process. And then their competitors started creating electronic computers. And IBM was really caught uh, on the back foot. And this coincided with a difficult transition point in IBM's history where Thomas Watson Sr. was getting older and Thomas Watson Jr. was rising and, and wanting to kind of was agitating to take over the business. And this, these two you know, really difficult transitions happened at the same time, this technological transition with a lot of competition. And then the, the patriarch and the, and the, and the, uh, the son kind of uh, facing a, a hinge point there as well. And they, they managed it quite well. And they, they eventually entered into electronic uh, computing and, and wound up overtaking competition. And the way that they did this was they focused on their core asset that differentiated them from everybody else. And what that was, was their, their sales force that had a lot of knowledge of customers and understood uh, what customers needed. They understood how to sell these, these machines to, uh, uh, to downstream players. And so I think what the, the core insight there is when, some, when one piece of the business is changing, you have to focus on what are the kind of complementary pieces of the business, the complementary assets that are still somewhat stable, still have value and, and differentiate you from others. And I think that really, you know, to Mark's point about you have to focus on what this core is. For IBM, it's maybe not obvious that we think about the, the sales force as being the core, but they really had that insight really doubled down on that. And it gave them like a port in the storm and gave them a fulcrum to manage this technological and family transition at the same time. And did it require to some degree members of the family agreeing upon that? So it's easy to see these two distinct perspectives of we want to take the organization in a different direction. But was that the element that pulled them together to say, this is our core resource capability that's going to help us compete. And we can agree upon that, even if we differ around some other elements. Yeah, I think that's a great, yeah, yeah. It's, I think that that is how it worked. I, I, I have to, I have to, there's, there's really good. So, so people that are interested in the story, uh, if you're a podcast listeners, I recommend there's a podcast called uh, Business Wars, which sounds kind of uh, goofy and it does, it is a little bit overproduced, but it does have some really nice insights. And there's a, there's a, there's a series about uh, IBM versus, uh, versus the Univac that goes through this in some detail. So I recommend that. Uh, but what they do talk about there is I think this was a point that Watson Jr. and Watson Sr. could agree on. It gave them sort of a, a place where they could, uh, Come together and, and agree that this is that the sales force is sort of their their core strength is something that Watson Senior had helped build, and so I think that there's kind of some uh, some some personal attachment there and gives them kind of gave them a a, a, a common ground to to swing kind of swing the company in a in a productive direction. Okay. Well, one of the common threads that we're exploring over the course of these four weeks together is the particular role of culture in driving performance. And we can think of that at different levels. We can think of that at the level of a country's culture. Obviously, we can think of it at the level of an organization's culture. Um, one of my favorite quotes on culture, which is, by the way, such an academic thing to say, uh, comes from uh, Boston Consulting Group's founder, Bruce Henderson. So he, he called culture a set of beliefs, traditions, taboos, habits, customs, and inhibitions that are as distinctive as the cultural differences between nationality or the personal differences between individuals. Therefore, they do not adapt to change very easily. I'm gonna hit this from a couple different angles, one from the academic side and one from the practitioner side. So Mark, let me start with you here. What does it look like to assess and perhaps even build the, cu the culture of an organization that you're looking to acquire? What do you pay attention to off the balance sheets or how it relates to the balance sheet tied towards firm culture? Well, I, I'm not sure I have too much more to add than that quote because uh, that quote says it all, which is it's incredibly hard to change a culture. 
because the culture, as we know, comes from the top. It comes from the organization. It permeates everything. So I think one of the big mistakes that people in, in our field make and oftentimes why acquisitions fail is this concept that we can change the culture in this business through the acquisition. And you, you might as well just put checkbox number one on why you're going to fail in that deal, because that's not going to happen. If you have a challenging culture, if there is a culture which you believe causes the difficulties or the performance or not customer first or whatever it might be inside of a business, that, that, is, that is years and years in the, in the changing because it was generations in the making. Um, it's a complete turnover of people of attitudes. It's really, really difficult. What we have done uh, in, term, in, in terms of trying to assess that is get as much one-on-one -on -one time as you can with as many people uh, because it, it's remarkable. You'll see it in a group setting, right? But and, and you'll see somebody who dominates a conversation or you'll see somebody who has that funny look across the room as someone is speaking that they just said something they weren't supposed to say. Um, but but you just don't know that what that can really mean. It's when you break it into small groups. It's when you get one-on-one -on -one with people that you get real insight as to what is the leadership culture, uh, how is the decision-making process, how do they think about the customer, what's the what is called what it may be the work-life balance. Is any of those things you're fo focused on? So we have in recognizing how important culture is really taken our diligence, if you will, and our sort of getting to know a company to a level that goes to many, many more one-on-ones, trying to get as close as we can to the individual to hear their thoughts rather than that sort of group think, group thought process. So I can't tell you how important it is, especially if you're doing an acquisition that isn't going to continue to stand on its own, but it needs to come together with another business then how do those two cultures come together and, and how do they deal with their channel and their customer? It's, it's the single, you, we've all read this, we've all seen it, but uh, it is, you know, if not number one, it's in the top few things that determine the success of a good acquisition. So one quick follow on point, and this may be a little bit of a tangent, but is that assessing of culture more difficult to do in a, middle of COVID work from home environment? I mean, how, how does that process look different right now for you all? Yeah, it, it is. That's a great point. We went through 2020 in a virtual due diligence world. And so that ability to uh, spend that time, whether it's dinners or whether it's some time away from the business, uh, whether it's meeting even someone else's family or in their home, uh, again, we're talking about family businesses, multi-generational. When you remove that and you move into what we're doing right here, you lose that entirely. Uh, as we all know, in group settings on a Zoom or a Teams call or whatever it might be, the loudest voices can win. And the younger or the less vocal people, they can easily fall to the background in this environment. And so if you, if you take that to the acquisition world or trying to understand a business culture, it, you can literally go and never hear from someone who may be a valued part of the team, but that's just not how they participate in this digital environment. Or if you get them one-on-one, -on -one, if you can get them away from work, if you can get them out to dinner, whatever it might be, you're always going to get some level of input. So it is really it has really put a challenge to the personal side of that, of that deal, if you will, about learning about that culture. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting thing to follow over time if you have this year of uh, acquisitions that have taken place and a good volume of acquisitions yeah. over the last year that have taken place without yeah. the same kind of diligence process. What is the success ratio? How does that look downstream? As a result. Yeah, and there's the and there's the technical side of the diligence, diligence, and we can all do that. We can get through all of those things that mattered. But but Peter, just what you were saying, which is that that more subjective side, that more you know touchy feely side, that culture side, it's really lost. Very difficult. Yeah. So Seth, over to you from the academic standpoint. We exist in similar departments. I'm on the organizational behavior side. You're over in the strategy and entrepreneurship group. Uh, and oftentimes, probably in every core OB class, there's some sort of slide that says uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast that people tend to uh, emphasize <laughs> in those yeah. classes. 
do you do you think we overestimate culture? What what's your view on the role of culture in driving performance in contrast to some of the things that you mentioned before, the resources that people have, the knowledge, the processes that organizations have embedded inside their systems? It's one of these, it's one of these really difficult things from an academic standpoint. I, I you know, there's been thousands of dissertations written about culture. And I, I imagine that this COVID uh, COVID shock and the and the you know the difficulty in doing this due diligence and, and assessing cultural fit and acquisitions will generate a few more of those dissertations, but it's just incredibly hard to uh, tell whether culture causes performance or performance causes culture. And you can even see this, those of you that are sports fans, you know, we often talk about teams having a good culture. Well, those teams are often winning and winning mm. solves a lot of problems. And, and just think about it this way. I mean, so, so COVID, uh, how do we know that vaccines work? We can do these awesome randomized control trials, give some people the vaccine, some people the placebo and see which one uh, works better. It's really hard to do that with academic studies of culture. It's, it's such a, and, you know, as everybody on the call knows, and, and, and Mr. Ramadori really pulled out, it's such a gradual piece by piece, uh, you know, you have to have transparency, accountability, demonstration of, of authority and, and uh, things like that. It's so difficult to study it academically uh, that I, I it's, it's, it's a very challenging thing, but I, but I still think, I think this idea of the culture eat strategy for breakfast is very true. Uh, because you know, I could write down the greatest strategic plan, you know, for a, for a client or a, a student startup or something like that. But if they don't have the culture in place to be able to execute, then it, it falls apart. So I, I, you know, so it's both this thing that's very hard to 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 have a clear view on, but at the same time, it's it's we all we all know it's clearly important. So I I'd, I'd love to know your 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 thoughts on that, Peter. Like, how do you when you teach uh, you know at your org change class and things like that? How do you what do you tell the students about about uh, how they can manipulate culture for for uh, performance benefit? Yeah, I mean that's a great that's a great question. I, mean, I think uh, this goes a little bit back to Mark's framing around the importance of people. I do think there are certain people that are catalysts for culture. You bring someone into an academic group, and all of a sudden it starts to change that people the way that people interact. Uh, it's not always necessarily the most central or highest ranking member of an organization. So oftentimes we talk about structuring a network and seeing really who's holding this culture together. And we've always had the experience where you have a cohesive group and then someone leaves, they may not be especially senior on the chart, but things feel a little bit different. So I don't think our methods are especially good at that, but I do think the network of people holds together a culture and uh, all your comments around the way that performance reinforces that I think are, are spot on. But I'm asking the questions here, Seth. So this is my, uh, my panel. Yeah, Peter, I would just have one more comment on that, and that is just the fact that that you know this comment you made, Seth, about you know how do you roll it out or whatever. I think there is some confusion or just some differentiation that culture and strategy are different, and so that you know culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I I actually think that oftentimes in an organization they are one in the same. How do you think about strategy? How do you roll it out? If you don't have a culture where you're using cascading objectives or whatever it is, that is your culture, right? So therefore you can't implement your strategy. So I think sometimes there is this artificial line between the two when in fact, that's what, that is what the organization really is. And if you can't, if you can't implement, that's your culture because you haven't built the, the sort of structure to do it. Sounds like, uh, Seth, we might need to merge our groups back together. So we're going to have yeah. a single strategy organization group. Yeah. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the role of a firm embedded in a broader regional culture. And in particular, I'm going to go back to an example that was heavy in the news over the last several years, a couple of years back now. But HQ2, right? Many cities were focusing mm -hmm. on the role of taking an organization that has a unique performance culture, uh, strategy, et cetera, and embedding it into a particular region. So let's move Amazon's second headquarter to St. Louis, to Cincinnati, to Chicago, to New York, to DC. Uh, is it possible to maintain the culture of a given organization when the culture of the ecosystem is radically different? We can think of this, by the way, as well, as you're seeing a migration of firms out of Silicon Valley, some down to Austin, Texas, What's the role of the broader ecosystem in shaping firm culture? And Mark or Seth, feel free to hop in with your particular take on this. 
I, I would just say that it, I think it is difficult as you get multi-site and as you grow to maintain the same. You, you've heard Google talk about it. You've heard many people talk about it. Um, we even see it in very small businesses. It, it, there's always a little bit of radar that goes up when you go from an organization that's built around an, an, a central location or two and how they manage it, how they drive that versus when you start to say it's eight or nine organi- uh, uh, locations. There's a European location with its own management team and its own headquarters versus the U.S. You're almost guaranteed at that point to start to have separate cultures and managing those cultures to build that same feel, even drive the same strategy, it, it's very difficult. So I, I can only imagine that as these, these are huge organizations, uh, but as they get further from, you know, the center, that, that you'll start to see some disparity in how they do what they do every day. And just to build upon that, Mark, before we go over to Seth, is that a problem? So are we okay if, let's say, Amazon's headquarter one feels different than Amazon's headquarter two, or Google's site one looks different in Silicon Valley than it would in their London offices? Can that be a strength, or do we see that as an inherent weakness as firms spread out across multiple locations? I'm, I'm going to give the same question that our answer that I have before. It uh, depends on the quality of leadership. It is not inherently a negative. Uh, especially if they're assimilating to the culture in which they are, right? Should you have a slightly different culture when you're based in Texas versus Seattle versus London versus Shanghai? Yeah, yeah, of course you should, right? Uh, Your people have a different culture. They come from different backgrounds, and you have to recognize that. But how you share people across those organizations, how you share ideas, how you co-mingle, you can manage that. So it's not inherently difficult, or it, it, it's not inherently worse, but it is difficult. And to do it well takes a great team. So Seth, we're going to volley it over to you. And again, we talked about Amazon moving headquarters. We can think of it as Silicon Valley firms moving to Austin, Texas. You can also think of it here in terms of our discussion of creating a tech ecosystem, right? There's this idea of how do we create a Silicon Valley of the Midwest? How do we create a culture of risk-taking and entrepreneurship here? What do you think is the relationship between firm culture and region or city or ecosystem culture? Um, How can they be leveraged? How can the risk be minimized? So on and so forth. Yeah, so I want to maybe take a, so my my perspective on this is is on average, this is just in in research, you know, this is just correlations. We see on average when firms enter uh, countries, this is at the country level, when a firm enters a country that has a culture that's different than its home country, on average, their performance tends to decline. But an interesting point is that while the average declines, the variance also increases. And so what that means is that you have some firms that enter new areas and they, and they succeed in a really big way. And so then the question is how, you know, what is, what's driving those players out in the right-hand tail? Like who is, who is really managing this cultural divide in a successful way? And I think one example here is, uh, is multinational firms that enter uh, Korea. So my, my colleague, Jordan Siegel uh, at Michigan has a really interesting study. And, I, and this is gonna be a little bit detailed, but I think the broader lessons that will become apparent. So these in Korea, they have a very patriarchal culture and multinational firms from the West entered there and they, they had a difficulty uh, hiring female employees at first because the talent pool for female employees was not very thick in Korea. But over time, these companies were able to uh, hire and retain the best female managers in Korea and really grow uh, on on the strength of their talent because this was an unexploited labor pool inside of the country that was not being taken advantage of by the extant players because of their existing culture. Whereas these multinational firms came in and had more egalitarian, less patriarchal culture and were able to successfully uh, exploit that sort of untapped resource. And so I think the challenge for any organization is trying to manage this cultural divide and do it successfully is trying to think about, okay, how can we you know, turn what we do rather than making it a, a weakness, turning it into a strength? And that's always, you know, it's not obvious, it's very easy to say that, very hard to do. Uh, but I think that's one example that is that really resonates with me and can maybe provide some you know, broader lessons for folks. So it sounds like to some degree, we're going to do some of the diligence process of how big is this market? How big is the opportunity? But we also have to do some sort of firm by location assessment 
around how do I think about my particular strengths, capabilities, things I'm going to hire for as they fit within this particular market. That could be a part of that ex, uh, expansion diligence process. Yeah, I think that's okay. the way. I think that's the way I would, would try to think about it. And, and again, it's very you know it's very simple. It's very not simple. It's very difficult and very context specific. And that's why you know like having a rich you know background like like marks and being able to you know spot these 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 corridors and see these these places for opportunity is so so important and, and you know so hard great so we've got about 20 minutes left and i want to hit on a couple of questions that are actually tied towards how we think about tata and tcs's broader social mission so a few ways to think about this right we clearly hear a unique focus on social impact and India impacts in particular, and how TCS has approached the structure of their trust, the distribution of processes, so on and so forth. Mark, you raised this at the front end, this underlying question around whether or not something like that could work in the US. I believe you said you think it would be difficult, but it could potentially work in some settings. I wonder if you could flesh out your own view around this. What would it look like for a model like that to work in the US? Yeah, th this is such an interesting point. Uh, I just find it fascinating about what they've done there. And, and I think it's important first to recognize that this is not uh, unheard of in the U.S., but it's different in the U.S. It goes back, if you go, you know, Carnegie, Rockefeller, what the Gates are doing right now, you know, Buffett, um, even the Taylor family here in St. Louis is, you know, all of this, this, um, these organizations and these trusts but what you see there is that there is a, a distinct separation between the company doing it and the shareholders doing it, between the families or the organizations or the trusts or the foundations and the companies. And often those trusts and foundations were established through an IPO or through the sale of the company. And then these huge endowments were created. Um, but it is rarely crossed that this is happening inside of the company. And I think that that what I heard today and I mentioned in the beginning was this transitional period. If you can imagine the emphasis at U.S. public companies on uh, the pay structure and the compensation structure of the management teams around shareholder value, around their option packages, around their long-term incentive programs, how driven the management teams are, right? First sentence of every first uh, business class you ever have, job of the CEO is to maximize shareholder value. Well, give 66% away, and in theory, the company drops by two-thirds out of the box, right? So this is, this is counter to everything that executive management has been taught in the U.S. It's counter to how management teams are compensated so to me, it goes back to this point uh, the, about transition. How do you go from point A, which is this emphasis on building value and wealth creation, to community building while at the same time building this great organization to give people opportunity to create income, to continue to fund that, that benevolent cause? So I, I think it can be done. I think it's just a very, very different structure than how that's been done for the last 200, 300 years in the United States. I don't think it's, I personally, I think it would be fantastic if there was a greater acceptance on Wall Street of a statement that said, we are going to reduce, and, and this is the wrong way to do it, but if you said, we are going to invest 20% of our discretionary income in community causes which we believe will drive better shareholder retention, build a better organization, build better customer interactions, and therefore ultimately drive more shareholder value. That's a long-term proposition. I think you can get there. What happens in between is, is a very unknown question when you talk about the amount of dollars that Tata was doing it with at two-thirds of the business. 10%, 5%, that happens. 20, 30, 40, that, that is not happening. And I think it's a, it's a, it would be a really interesting proposition as to whether the analyst community could be sold that that's an effective strategy. 
So there's been obviously a lot of conversation around these types of topics in the last um, few years in particular. So CEO yep. roundtable yep. discussions around what's the purpose of an organization, conversations yep. this last summer around how we think about issues of racial equity, racial justice inside our organization. Do you think that that conversation is happening at a slightly different level or does it feel more surfacey than what we're seeing inside Tata or TCS more broadly? What's the difference between what we heard here today and the conversations we've heard more broadly in the public about the public responsibility, social responsibility of the corporation? I'll say what I said before, and I believe this from my involvement in organizations in the St. Louis area, I do believe that there is more uh, focus on this. I believe that there is truly more effort behind it, but I still believe it's happening largely at the individual level or it's happening at the shareholder level or the family level or the foundation level. I, and I think that corporations internally are talking about it, but I think there is still this struggle, which is, all right, we know we need to do this. We're going to do it. it, it uh, our younger employees want us to do it. They want that involvement. It's important to them. But what level can we do this at without sort of that reverberating through our broader shareholder value proposition. And that's a transition that can take time. Uh, I do think it will happen. I think that conversation is happening at the board level, uh, but I think it's a, that is a very difficult transition to happen where that becomes part of the everyday corporate culture of, of really redistributing what was shareholder wealth to a, a new direction. Seth, you sent Mark and I in preparation a note on Tata's uh, CSR policy. You've been reading a little bit about this. Same question to you. I'm curious what you think is distinct here and whether or not or in what ways some of these lessons could be applied to organizations within the states. What I, what I find really interesting about Tata and just to, to, to frame this conversation, I would make a distinction here between shareholder profit and shareholder welfare. And so the fact that Tata is so large and so integrated into the economy and the, and the social fabric of India means that for them, it might actually be shareholder uh, welfare maximizing to donate two thirds of their profits because they internalize a lot of the benefits from those, those donations in a way that I don't know that there are companies in the United States. That, I mean, we, you know, for all the talk of corporate concentration and the size of Amazon and Google and Facebook and so on. I don't know that we have a company that is so large that it would be able to internalize the externalities, you know, to be just like buzz, too many buzzwords, but to basically be able to capture the value that Tata creates by, uh, by making these big donations. So I think in some ways, you know, Tata, we, their, 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 um, their generosity should absolutely be lauded. And I'm, I'm sure they're not, I'm not trying to say they're doing this for, you know, a, a, like a gimlet eyed sort of, uh, 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 you know, sharp edge strategy, but it makes it easier for them in some ways because they are so integrated in the community that, you know, the rising tide that they create by donating uh, profits really lifts their, their, um, their boat in particular. And so in the U.S., uh, you know, the, the, the different, the structure of, of, uh, of the economy being different, I think it's harder to get those, those kind of uh, profit-oriented motives behind these donations in the same way that it might work in, in India. So that, that for me is a structural difference that, that, that might be a barrier to a long-term kind of like uh, adoption of this kind of model in the States. We obviously have ways to measure shareholder profit more easily. They're accepted, they're shared along the way. Um, measurement is gonna be critical for any sort of movement in this direction. How would you encourage someone to get their arms around measuring shareholder welfare to your words earlier? <laughs> wow, that's that is yeah. That's that. There's some there's some dissertations to be written there as well, right? Uh, yeah, we're so, finding so many dissertations today. This is perfect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> of course, that's what everybody wants, right? No, yeah. I that that is that is incredibly incredibly challenging. I you know, I I I wish I had an answer. That's just a tough one. I you know the, the simple simple answer is I I don't know. I, I don't know. I, what, what do you think, Peter? I, I'll turn. I'll turn. No, it I, you know, I only ask the questions that I don't know the answer to. So, <laughs> so we're going to continue to our next one here. I, I want to throw out one more question to you all, um, and then we're going to see if there's any questions that are coming in on the thread as well. Nothing yet, but please do weigh in because this is a great opportunity to learn from Mark and Seth about these particular questions. 
Um, one of the things that I thought was especially interesting about the way that they structured their growth in India was this intentional selection of industries that would work to develop the country as a whole. And then to build around these support structures, think for example, education, educational support structures to enable the kind of people to uh, be employed inside these organizations. I wanna zero in uh, in particular on St. Louis here. So there's a lot of conversations inside Greater St. Louis Inc and looking at Cortex and other such places around whether or not we need to select sectors that fit with this particular region and then build around support structures for the talent needs of a particular region as well. So for example, let's say you uh, wanna develop companies in the biotech space uh, because of the fact that there's a really strong research program in medical school here. And let's say there's tech supporting needs here. So you wrap around launch code or invest in your public schools in order to make sure that the graduates are um, prepared to enter into the workforce. Maybe you find ways to keep your graduates from SLU and WashU and other institutions across town still within this particular region. I'm curious what you think, what it might look like for a company or a particular region to apply Tata's model of economic development in this holistic fashion to the city of St. Louis. You are both St. Louis natives or at least Missouri St. Louis area natives. I know each of you cares deeply about this particular piece. I'm curious how you would approach this. So we're gonna start in this case first with Seth and then we'll go over to Mark right afterwards. Seth, if you were to be advising groups on how to think about this in the context of St. Louis, what would you encourage them to think about? So there are two, two, two quick points. The first one, I think Boeing is a great example of a company that's managed to do this pretty well here in St. Louis. Uh, so their workforce development program in partnership with St. Louis Community College is, is a fantastic example of a company that seems to have done this the right way. So if you graduate from high school and you go and interview with, with Boeing, they will enroll you in a five-week program where after, after you finish, you have 90% uh, odds of getting an assembly line job with Boeing that pays uh, $17 an hour. And in many cases, they'll, after after you finish and kind of advance the program, they'll, they'll give you another 15 grand towards further post-secondary education. And uh, this they've employed like 900 people through this uh, program. It's become a talent uh, pipeline for them. I think that's a great example of a company using its own, you know, its own, its own profit motive to have, uh, you know, good workforce here in St. Louis to, uh, to, to help uh, to help lift lift uh, other other folks up, I think that's a, and it's kind of a public private partnership there between Boeing and St. Louis Community College. So I think that that's a great example. But, but I'm more skeptical of efforts at the city level to grow particular industries. And you know you know the buzzword is picking winners and losers. I'm, I'm there's so much research that suggests that these efforts fail uh, when governments, whether at the city, national, or uh, state level, try to pick industries to be strong in. So what I would if I could be uh, you know, a uh, uh, leader for a day or something. What I would emphasize is something along the lines of what uh, the state of Tennessee has done. So Nashville is a great success story. And part of what goes on there is they have very, um, it's very easy to, to, to build new things in Nashville. Their, their building codes are, are relatively, uh, relatively lax. And so you can see a lot of quick growth. And they also have free community college. And so those two things I think are kind of like cross sector, helpful uh, rules that can benefit everybody. And then as opportunities arise, you know, this playing field is out there the, the, that anybody can sort of like plant a seed and, and grow rather than trying to say pick like geospatial, uh, try to pick biotech. It's so hard to know how things will change in the future. And these plans take so long to come into fruition that, you know, 10 years from now, who knows where the world's gonna be. So I think it's better to have these kind of like flat, sort of flat investments that benefit everybody. And then we just see, uh, see, see what happens after that. Great. So we're going to tee it over to Mark here in a second. Seth, I do want to highlight the fact that Marie Casey has a, a potential proposition for you on how to think about shareholder value. I'd love for you to look in the Q&A there and we'll Fantastic. come back to you for your take on that question. But Mark, what about from your perspective? You've been now in St. Louis uh, for a good portion of your career, the last 23 years at Harbor. You've seen uh, the economy shift over time here. If you were advising leaders of the city, leaders of organization, um, leaders of colleges and universities on how to think about this, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I, I would agree with Seth that it's very hard to pick winners. Uh, I think that that uh, industries themselves in communities, that happens organically. 
uh, and we've seen it, ag sciences, the healthcare sector here, um, what's happened in Cortex, so many of the successes, largely organic, um, and you get to a critical mass point where you start to get this, it gets its own momentum. Uh, if I was advising the leadership here, um, there has been an enormous transition in St. Louis over the years from very, very, very large corporate to very, very mid-sized uh, entrepreneurial growing businesses. If I was leadership in the entire community, I would make it easier for them to succeed uh, to Seth's point, but, but, and, and that's in every way. I, I would I would ask every company that has 10 employees, what is it that you need to get your 11th? If you have 100, what do you need to have 110? If you have 1,000, what do you need to have 1,100? I would turn the sights onto that middle market, and I would say we are going to make this community in such a way between public and private partnerships, but really to say we're going to create the opportunity for those organizations to grow by 10%, right? And then another 10%, because when it comes down to it, every time an organization grows 15 or 20%, every three, four, five years, if you think of the classic rules, they're doubling, and then they double again, and they double again, right? And the momentum behind that in terms of opportunity for people and um, the wealth creation and that opportunity to have um, greater community focus from those organizations. I would also try to create, and this goes to a little different direction, um, a, 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 a few key areas of focus from that um, community perspective, right? A couple of areas where you can bring together. Organizations, to your point before, Peter, are looking for a way to participate. They're looking for their way for their employees to participate in all of these things from you know, opportunity gap to racial inequities to appropriate training to disadvantaged communities, and I, I, if if the if those that have a very good understanding of what has to happen in some of those key areas around the community would come forward and create three or four runways for the community that the private side could get on board, right? So that we bring all of these resources and all of these efforts of the for-profit and the not-for-profit community around a couple key initiatives or five key initiatives, then you would have so much sort of piling on. And you would get that same natural momentum of doubling and tripling and increasing in value of those efforts in the community. And I, and I think if, if, if the public side would focus on creating those runways, for the private side to participate from the community side. And then they would allow them to say, how do we grow your businesses steadily every year? How do we give you the opportunity to grow at five, 10, 15% every year, instead of trying the land HQ2 or the big behemoth corporate, but let's take what's here and create the, create the opportunity for real growth every year. That's job That's creation. And ultimately we need the private sector to do job creation. You're not going to have, you know, there's this famous line out there that any politician that rolls in town and says, hey, I'm going to create jobs. Everybody should, you know, sort of run for the hills. They just can't do it, but they can create partnership and opportunity for the private sector to do it. That's great. So, Seth, I'm going to go back to you for our final rapid fire response here. There was a take from Marie about how to think about shareholder value, shareholder value creation. What's your response to that view? And then I'll offer a few closing thoughts before I turn it over to Barton. Yeah, that's great. So the yeah, so the view in the chat was that uh, we should think about shareholder welfare may be misleading because it implies uh, sort of a connotation of low returns. I think that's that's a great point. Like welfare is such a it's one of these words that has so many different meanings, especially in the U.S. context. It can be it can be a difficult one to, difficult one to work with. So I think the distinction that I I'd, I would make would say between maybe shareholder profit maximization versus shareholder value maximization. So the profit side would imply like the returns they get from holding, say, Tata stock. And then on the value side would be sort of like the, their quality of life and their overall uh, economic opportunity and the, uh, uh, their ability to, to, to rise and, and live the life they want. So I'd say, yeah, rather than welfare, let's talk about profit and value. Fantastic. Well, Mark and Seth, I want to thank you for your willingness to engage in this conversation with us. Uh, and thanks to all of you that are out there on the line here today. I know it's quite a bit to give two hours of your morning to us. 
to be able to wrestle with some of these questions. But I know one of the things that I'm really excited about in this particular role and work with you all in the community is I think we can think through some really interesting questions together. What is the role of the family organization in creating jobs across our region? What is the role of the family philanthropic side and foundation side in creating some value? What's the role in family investment in driving uh, different approaches to private equity, venture capital, and the like. So there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to be able to explore both across the next month and then obviously together over the course of our time here uh, at the center. So Bart, I'm going to tee it up over to you to conclude our first part of the symposium. Great. Uh, thank you all. Really, really insightful panel. Thanks, uh, Seth, uh, Mark, and Peter. I hope some of our leaders in the city were listening. Um, I think there are a lot of great insights. And I think just uh, for the whole day, our speakers, uh, Spencer and Mr. Ramadori, really great day together. And uh, as Peter said, this is just the first of our events this month. Um, our next event will be Wednesday, February 10th, uh, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Same format as today. We're going to have Lisanne uh, Dorian from the board director of Bacardi. And we look forward to having you join us then. Um, and we'll see you next week. That's our that's our next week's speaker. So thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you uh, next week.